Hi guys, Andrew with headphones.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about this. This is the brand new Cord Mojo 2 portable DAC amp combo. And in this video, we're gonna check out if it's any good. So I'm gonna start off by just taking it out of the box here. You get the wonderful documentation, all right? Safety instructions. And then inside the box, we ha Oh, it's empty. God damn it, not again. Darren? I've lost my mojo! Hello everyone, I'm Golden Sound. You're watching the Headphone Show by Headphones.com. This is the Cord Mojo 2, and it's a really impressive little device. Currently the lowest price DAC in Cord's product range at $775. This is a DAC and amp combo that whilst primarily aimed at portable use, it performs so well that for a lot of people, this is gonna be not just a substitute for, but an upgrade from your current desktop DAC. For full transparency, the Mojo 2 is available to purchase at headphones.com, but this is not a review unit. I didn't get sent this. I bought this with my own money at full retail price a few months ago, actually. All thoughts and opinions are entirely my own. The first thing we have to talk about is build quality and form factor. Being a portable device, it needs to be something which you can comfortably slip into your pocket and carry around. And weighing in at just over 180 grams and no larger than the average wallet, it does that quite well. The build quality on the Mojo 2 is quite simply fantastic. Using a similar milled matte black finish chassis to many of Cord's desktop products with rounded edges that fit very comfortably in the palm of your hand and even including both micro USB and USB-C digital inputs. So you don't need to worry about fumbling around with lots and lots of cables. It'll take whatever you happen to have in your bag at the time. My only real gripe with the design of the Mojo 2 is that everything is done through the use of these color changing buttons. There's no display and none of the buttons even have fixed functions other than the power button. And this means that for a while after you get the Mojo 2, you might find yourself referring to the manual quite a lot until you've got everything memorized. But despite the initially frustrating controls, the features that they access are absolutely worthwhile. The Mojo 2 has two key features which allow you to tune the sound to your tastes, the first of which is crossfeed. This feeds some of the signal from the left channel into the right channel with a very small delay, and the same from right to left. What this does is aim to emulate the effect of listening to a pair of speakers, where each ear can hear both channels just at slightly different volumes and times, as opposed to headphones where each ear just hears the one channel. So this is a pretty nice feature for people who prefer a bit more of a speaker-like out in front of you presentation, as opposed to a more typical headphone presentation. I do find that this works better with headphones that have sound stage to begin with. Headphones that don't stage very well don't really take advantage of this, but if your headphones do stage very well, that can be quite good fun to play around with. And the second feature is a four band equalizer, allowing you to change the amplitude of various areas of the frequency spectrum, meaning with a few clicks, you can turn up a little bit more bass, tone down the treble somewhat, add a little bit more upper treble and space, whatever fits your preferences best. Those two features really allow you to tune the sound quite a lot to your preferences, and it's really nice to have them done so well in such a portable device. And an important aspect of any portable device, battery life, which on the Mojo 2 has been stellar easily lasting me through multiple full work days without needing to recharge it. Absolutely excellent battery life, no qualms whatsoever. And especially given the processing power that's in this, I'm really impressed it lasts as long as it does. Remember how I said that the Mojo 2 might just replace your desktop DAC? Well, it's got one feature over the original Mojo, which helps it to be a little bit more applicable for this use case called intelligent desktop mode. Instead of just charging the device to 100% all the time, which will wreck your battery capacity, don't charge your phone to 100%, charge it to about 80, don't let it drain to zero, keep it above 20%. It charges the battery to a healthy level and keeps it there, meaning you can just leave this plugged in permanently in use as a desktop DAC without worrying about degrading the battery capacity when you do want to take it on the go. If you're interested in measurements and objective performance of the Mojo 2, then head over to the audio files at headphones.com, which is also objectively the best name for a website. There's too many tests to go through in this video alone, so the bulk of the measurements are posted in the accompanying written post for this video. Head over there if you'd like to see measurements for this and future source gear as well. What you're about to see is just my personal subjective experience with the Mojo 2. I've had the Mojo 2 for a few months now, and I've been using it in a lot of different situations. I mostly bought it for portable use, and so IEMs have been my main use case, but I have also spent quite a bit of time with it with full-size headphones. 
It can supply up to 0.6 watts at 30 ohms, so it can power most headphones without much issue. I personally really enjoyed both the Meze 109 Pros and the Sennheiser HD 100S. Both of those pairings worked really nicely. But whilst all of the dynamic driver headphones I tried on the Mojo 2 were excellent, Planars were a little bit more of a mixed bag, and if you're planning on running power-hungry Planars, I would recommend getting an external amplifier and just use this as a DAC. Things like the Hypermancer Zvara, for example, these just didn't sound very good on the Mojo 2. Standalone, the soundstage was closed in, the dynamics were quite soft, it didn't have much impact, it just sounded like it was struggling, even if they were loud enough. Whereas as soon as I put the Mojo 2 feeding an external amplifier like a Ferrum Ore and have that power the headphones, the experience was much better. So this is a DAC into an external amplifier for power hungry headphones, works excellently. I wouldn't recommend trying to run really tough to drive stuff directly on the Mojo 2. The first thing that really stood out to me about the sound of the Mojo 2 was the resolution. Comparing to some more affordable portable devices like the Hydez S9 Pro or the Luxury and Precision W2131, there is a noticeable step up in detail retrieval. Not only that, but the Mojo 2 also represented the fast transients in music, quite a bit clearer than the other two dongles, whilst being less fatiguing. This ability to be massively incisive without any hint of fatigue is really quite rare, even amongst Chord's other product offerings. The Dave, for example, I thought was one of the most detailed DACs that I've ever heard, but with the slight caveat that it's a little bit on the aggressive side and it can be just a bit sharp, a little bit fatiguing, depending on what you pair it with. The cutest was kind of the other way, being a little bit too polite, holding back on the macrodynamics and impact of things. This strikes a really, really nice neutral and natural sounding balance. It doesn't exaggerate any of the macrodynamics, but it doesn't hold anything back either. I actually prefer the Mojo 2 outright as a standalone DAC compared to the cutest, which is a fair bit more expensive and doesn't fit in your pocket. Just on sound alone, I think this is a better DAC. Transient heavy tracks like Polyphia's Playing God absolutely shine on the Moto 2. And swapping from it to the Luxury and Precision W2131, it lost some of the speed and tactility of those transients, coming across a little bit less resolving and a bit blunted. This is still an excellent product. It's half the price after all, and in its price category, I think it does really, really well. But in comparison to the Moto 2, it's just not quite in the same tier. Swapping to the S9 Pro, interestingly, we regained a little bit of that speed and incisiveness, but everything was noticeably more sterile sounding. Everything was more closed in and much less clearly defined as a point in space. It was much more of a wall of sound coming at you rather than individual elements coming out of a 3D environment. And the body and texture of the guitars just felt quite a bit more thin. It was quite a technical presentation and the actual detail retrieval was pretty good, but it also just overall sounded considerably more artificial than either of the other two devices. There are some results in the measurements though, which potentially explain these differences. The W2 sounding slightly blunted in comparison to the Mojo 2, for example, could be explained either by the fact that this actually very slightly attenuates high level signals, or the fact that for high level signals, they have proportionally more distortion than low level signals. Whereas on the Mojo 2, distortion rises proportionally to signal level at all times. And ignoring noise and harmonic distortion, the Mojo 2 has a reconstruction filter which is much higher performance than basically any DAC on the market besides those in Chord's own product lineup. So it actually adheres better to Nyquist theory than most DACs, and this could potentially explain why things like perceived separation and transients are better for me on the Mojo 2 than on the other devices. Head over to the audio files post at the link in the description if you're interested in seeing the full measurements. But when I started to put this in a desktop setup, just as a DAC into the Ferrum Ore, powering things like the Hypermancer's Vara or the RAL CA1A, that's when it started to become apparent just how good this is as a DAC, period let alone as a portable device. This is absolutely on par with DACs in the $700 to $1,000 price point. I spent some time comparing the Mojo 2 to a good desktop DAC that I also would describe as quite neutral sounding, the SMSL SU10. And it's really hard to pick a clear winner. The SU10 does beat the Mojo 2 in sheer detail retrieval, but I also found it to be slightly more fatiguing and slightly more aggressive in its signature. The Mojo 2 also did a better job with soundstage, being able to both place things more convincingly far away from me and giving clearer separation to the elements in the mix. 
When listening to Julian Lage's auditorium, I could hear a little bit more low-level information from any given instrument on the SU-10, but everything was also a little bit more blended together, a little bit more coming at you all at once. Whereas on the Mojo 2, you stepped down just a tiny little bit in detail retrieval, but it was as if everything was a little bit more in focus and a little bit more, well, realistic, for lack of a better word. It was much easier to pick out and listen to any one particular element in the mix without having anything else overlap or distract from it. The SU-10 might extract a little bit more detail, but there is an effortlessness and realism to the Mojo 2 that just kept me listening for long periods of time. I mentioned earlier that the Mojo 2 doesn't have any built-in wireless capability, so you need to keep it hooked up to your PC or your phone in order to actually play through it. This isn't an issue if you're just at a desk or in bed or something, but keeping it on the go, taking it even just around the house, that's not super convenient. And so you might want to consider this, the Cord Poly. This is a pretty unique wireless streaming device. It can just act as a basic Bluetooth receiver if you want, but as you might already know, Bluetooth isn't lossless. It compresses your music when you use it, even if you're using a high performance codec like Aptex HD or LDAC. And so the Poly is primarily centered around a Wi-Fi connection. On the go, it creates its own Wi-Fi hotspot, and you can then cast your music bit perfect and lossless using it as a UPnP or AirPlay renderer. And at home, for those of you using Rune, which if you're not, you should be. They have a two week free trial, go and try it. This isn't sponsored by Rune, I just really like Rune. And at home, for those of you using Rune, it acts as a ready-to-go Rune endpoint. Simply add it as an output, and away you go. Also, if you don't want to use any kind of streaming at all, you can put a micro SD card with up to one terabyte of music into the Poly itself, and play directly from that. I think the Poly's a really cool device. It's really convenient to use, it just turns on and off when you turn the Mojo on and off. There's basically nothing which allows you to stream lossless in the way that this does. The main downside of the Poly, though, is that it costs about the same as the Mojo 2 itself, so the two of these together is quite an expensive combination. Though even at the higher price for the Mojo and Poly combo, I really feel this is competing on sound quality with higher priced digital audio players, so it's still pretty compelling, especially when you think that most of those dApps don't have the ability to work as a Rune endpoint, don't have the ability to work as a DNLA renderer or AirPlay, they're not this compact usually, battery life is usually worse, it's a really compelling option. If you really don't want to pay that much to add wireless to the Mojo though, there may be some third party options which will get the job done for a lower price, albeit with fewer features. The X-Duo 05 BL Pro works very nicely if you remove one of the jacks. It just clips onto the end of the Mojo and that allows you to use LDAC Bluetooth with it. I actually got this custom adapter from a friend of mine, Skedra, at Viking Weave Cables. This isn't available to purchase, but it's just a cool example of what can be done with a little bit of work. So in conclusion, for me, the Mojo 2 is an excellent product. The build quality, sound quality, and feature set are all fantastic for the price, and it punches really far above its price point in the portable market. With desktop stuff, it's really comparable to similarly priced options, albeit much more compact, and the fact that it fits in your pocket as well if you do want to take it on the go is just icing on the cake. I'd be really inclined to compare this to much more expensive DAPs than those in its price point. And in desktop use, honestly, the only downside is that you have to buy an RCA adapter and there's no balanced output. But that about wraps it up. If you like the video, please leave a like down below or a comment of what you might like to see reviewed in the future. And if you want to come chat or need any audio related advice, come and say hi on our Discord server or the headphones.com forum. Subscribe for more videos like this. Until next time.